So Alex O'Connor, who you might also know as Cosmic Skeptic, recently did an 850,000 subscriber Q&A video. The first question that he got to, he actually mentions antinatalism. So I thought we'd go over it in this video. If a mysterious stranger offered you a chance to play this game, would you? If you agree to play, he will flip a coin. If the coin lands on heads, you'll go to heaven forever, which is as awesome as you could possibly want. If it lands on tails, you will go to hell, where you will be tortured maximally for the rest of time. If you choose not to play, you will live until the end of your natural life, and then your consciousness will cease to exist forever. Okay, so if we don't play at all, there's nothing, no afterlife whatsoever. If we choose to play, we flip the coin, and there's 50% chance of infinite good, essentially, and 50% chance of infinite bad. On face value, it seems like we should treat these equally and be indifferent, because infinity one way, infinity the other way, 50-50% chance, that should sort of cancel out in terms of expected value to zero. And on the other side, you have literally zero. So maybe we should be indifferent. But that doesn't feel right. I mean, the difference between choosing a kind of existence whose expected value is something like zero, but will in fact always be infinitely good or infinitely bad, seems very different from like no experience whatsoever. More importantly, however, consider a point that I first learnt from David Benatar, who is the author of Better Never To Have Been and a somewhat famous antinatalist. Benatar makes the case that suffering counts for more than pleasure does. And the way he does this is he asks a question. He says, would you take 30 seconds of the worst imaginable pain, just complete torture, if afterwards you were granted 30 seconds of the greatest joy and pleasure that you could imagine? Maybe you would say yes. Intuitively, I just say no. So obviously Alex has already touched on a thought experiment that Benatar uses to try and show to people that actually it's a pretty widely held intuition that suffering counts for more than pleasure does. But I also want to add a few additional things onto what Alex has said that I think are relevant to our everyday lives. Of course, the example that Alex is responding to with infinite good and infinite bad is not realistic. The additional differences I want to talk about are grounded in a realistic life for a human or any other sentient being for that matter. So as well as that value-based asymmetry that Benatar talks about regarding the pleasures and pains in life, he also lays out a few other more empirical ones. For example, in his paper Life is Not Good, he says this, whereas the most intense pleasures such as sexual or gustatory ones are short-lived, the worst pains have the capacity to be much more enduring. Indeed, pleasures in general tend to be shorter-lived than pains. Chronic pain is common, whereas is there is no such thing as chronic pleasure. And I want to add on top of that, that even if someone could find a condition where someone does genuinely suffer from some sort of chronic pleasure, these are going to be exceedingly more rare than the cases of chronic pain. He then goes on to lay out a few more considerations about the asymmetries between pains and pleasures. Consider how an injury can be incurred in a split second and the effects felt for life. While it is true that we can also avoid an injury in an instant, we do not gain benefits that are comparable in their magnitude and longevity in a mere moment. A lifetime of learning can be obliterated by a cerebral stroke, but there are no comparable events in which one acquires as much knowledge and understanding so speedily and easily. One can lose a limb or an eye in a few seconds, whereas gaining mobility or sight, where it is possible at all, never occurs so rapidly, effortlessly and completely. A life in which benefit came quickly and effortlessly effortlessly and harm came only slowly and with effort would be a fantastically better life. And maybe a final asymmetry I want to touch on is one he mentions about desires. Consider the fulfillment of our desires or the satisfaction of our preferences. There are various reasons why there is more unfulfillment than fulfillment. First, many desires are never fulfilled. Second, even when desires are fulfilled, this usually occurs only after the exercise of effort. This means that there is a period of time in which the desire is not yet fulfilled. Finally, when desires desires are eventually fulfilled, the satisfaction is typically only transitory. Satisfied desires give way to new desires. For example, one is hungry, eats to satiety, but then becomes hungry again. Thus, a relatively small proportion of life is spent satisfied. So whilst those things I've just laid out aren't directly relevant to the case that Alex is talking about in this clip, relating it to antinatalism, I think those are relevant to our everyday lives and the considerations we have to make. I feel like I wouldn't take that offer and I can't really explain why, it just seems like it wouldn't be worth it, because something about the suffering seems worse than the pleasure seems good, if you know what I mean. So if we follow that intuition and think that it's correct, then applied to this case, 50% chance in either direction, 
the 50% chance of eternal suffering is actually much worse than the 50% chance of infinite good is good, if you know what I mean. I mean, it's not literally infinite, that's an unhelpful terminology, but like maximally good and maximally bad. The bad would be more bad than the good is good. And so in that case, I probably would rather not flip the coin. Another thing to mention here that's relevant to antinatalism, and I know Alex isn't directly talking about antinatalism anymore, but if we relate this to antinatalism, this question was asked to him, not about the case of creating someone else. And we need to remember that whilst these odds that he's being presented are very bad, and I would say the odds that we have in reality when it comes to procreative choices are also very bad, the odds that Alex is considering here are for himself, whereas procreative odds, the consequences are suffered by the person you create. The odds that Alex is talking about, no matter how bad they are, they seem more palatable if we're the ones voluntarily making the decision for ourselves, rather than making the decision on behalf of someone else and they have to suffer the consequences. And that's the case in procreation. Again, as David Benatar said in his book, Better Never To Have Been, the optimist surely bears the burden of justifying this procreational Russian roulette. If we count not only the unusually severe harms that anybody could endure, but also the quite routine ones of ordinary human life, then we find that matters are still worse for cheery procreators. It shows that they play Russian roulette with a fully loaded gun, aimed of course not at their own heads, but at those of their future offspring. Having said that, the questioner adds, if you wouldn't play, imagine he started haggling with you and offering you better odds than a coin flip. How good would the odds have to be in favour of heaven at a minimum before you agreed to play? The problem is it's very difficult to quantify this difference between suffering and pleasure that I sort of intuitively feel, but I imagine that if you gave me like, even like a 75% chance, I don't know if that's worth running the risk of eternal torture forever. I mean, even if you're doing this at the cost of potentially getting something great, eternal suffering forever is like the worst thing that I can imagine. It's almost infinitely bad. I mean, it seems to be potentially infinitely bad because it goes on forever. And so compared to like the nothingness of not flipping the coin, even that like tiny chance of the worst possible thing forever, I think probably just outweighs it. So I still think I probably wouldn't flip the coin. Maybe if there was like a 99.999% chance, then I would flip the coin, which seems ludicrous, but like, I'm just so put off by hell that I wouldn't want to take that chance. Uh, even then with those kinds of odds, I think I'd still hesitate and ultimately maybe be too scared to flip the coin. So I'm not sure that there would be odds that you could offer me when the alternative is like definitely not suffering forever. And then one final thing I wanted to sign off with is just to go back to the actual odds that Alex is talking about. Many people in the world have a religious worldview where they do think there is a heaven and a hell and perhaps they wouldn't define them as being infinitely good or infinitely bad but they would be extremely good and extremely bad at the least. Maybe they would say they're infinitely good and infinitely bad but for those people when it comes to their procreative decisions this is actually the situation they are in. In their eyes, in their worldview, these are the odds that they are taking on behalf of their child. Their child could end up in hell in their eyes. That's something that those people who believe in heaven and hell, I think, need to take really seriously and consider carefully when they're making a choice to create a child. And from the people I've spoken to who have these views, they really haven't thought about that seriously. Anyway, let me know what you thought of what Alex said in the clip, what I said in response, and I'll see you in the next one.